title of this presentation is The Religion of 666. And as I'm sure you know, we get this number, 666. It's found in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 18. And here, talking about the number of the beast, John says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding count the number of the beast, for his number is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. The Bible warns us against the number of the beast, this mystical number, six, six, six. And let me also emphasize this. The number is 666. The number is not actually 666. Even though you might hear me refer to it, it's good to remember that the number is 666. Well, what's the difference, you might ask? Well, nowadays, people try and apply this number in lots of different places. And so what they do is try and see if they can find the number six used three times. So to give a simple example, barcodes. If you look at a barcode, you will find on any barcode, there are three strips that are slightly longer than the other strips on the barcode. And these are actually representing the number six. The number six is used to divide up the two different sections of a barcode. So people looked at that and they said, well, look, there's a six here, a six there, and a six there. This must be the number of the beast. But of course, the Bible says the number is 666, not just three sixes where you find them. So much has been said. Hello? Thank you. Hello? 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 Okay, whoever's not muted, can you please mute? And I will ask uh, one of the hosts to mute everybody, please. So this number, a lot has been written and said about the meaning of the number 666. So is it possible that we can really understand what the Bible is referring to? In this presentation, we're going to look at the history of this number and the real application of it today. So let's go through. Now, since the creation of the world, mankind has looked at the sky in wonder. Instead of seeing it as a part of God's creation, mankind came to view the sun as the life giver, and so the sun was worshipped in that respect. In ancient Babylon, the first great world-conquering empire, the worship of the sun became refined into the astrological religion that has survived through the ages down to today. Now, how did the astrological religion develop? Well, first of all, what the Babylonians did was they said the, sun, the, sorry, the earth is the center of the universe. And they thought that the sun revolved around the earth. And so they plotted the course. And as you can see at the graphic here, the red representing the day, the blue representing the night. There was this circle where the sun traveled across the top of the earth during the day and then underneath the earth at night. And they divided this up into 12 sections, six for the day and six for the evening. And this is where we get the idea of 12 hours from as well, although of course we now have 24 hours because we have it in two twelves. The Babylonians then further divided up these divisions. These were known as houses, each house the sun went through, so six houses for day and six houses for night. But in these houses, each one of them had three rooms. And so in every 30 degree section of the sky, there was three rooms, 10 degrees, for each section. So the, tra the sun traveled through the three rooms of the 12 houses in 24 hours. Now what the Babylonians then did was they gave a number to each one of the rooms. So if you've got 36 rooms, you can very simply say you've got the numbers one through 36. And then what they discovered was this, that if you add the numbers one to 36, so one plus two plus three plus four plus five, any idea what number you get to? Well, yes, for the purposes of this presentation, of course, it comes out to 600 
and 66. And this was how this number was derived for the Babylonians, because this number was a Babylonian number of 666. The number 666 represented all of the gods together. There were 36 gods, one for each house that the sun went through. God number one, of course, that was the most important god. That was the sun god. God number two represented the moon. And then there were other deities that they created representing all of the numbers, but having different powers or different authorities. Now, the problem from the Babylonian point of view was that when you were walking around from day to day, you wanted to be protected by these gods, but also from these gods, because there was a concern that the gods may get angry with you and punish you. So what they would do is they would carry with them the number of the god. But the problem was, if you carried the number of one god with you and you incurred the anger of another god, well, what were you going to do? For the Babylonians, they drew up these amulets, which you can see here. This would be the size of a, a medallion or a large coin, something you could slip in your pocket and keep with you. And you will see on the reverse of these medallions, doesn't matter what the mystical signs were on the front, but on the reverse, they were, there were these numbers, these grids with numbers, six numbers across by six numbers down. And in fact, if you were to add up these numbers, add them up across, add them up going down, and you would get to the number 111. And then if you added all three rows up, you would get to, of course, you would get to the number 666. And so these amulets, these 666 amulets were containing the mystical number of all the gods carried as charms to keep away any harm by showing the owner's allegiance to the astrological god. Now, when ancient man viewed the sun through half-closed eyes, he got this cross symbol. And so the cross became one of the first symbols of the sun god. And we can find it being used in Egypt, for example. And there's a very good example, the, the regular cross, the, the north, south, east, west, if you like, cross, but also you see the wavy lines in between. This was another cross added onto it. The cross with straight lines representing the male, the cross with wavy lines representing the female. In Egypt, they had another version of the cross. This was the Tau cross, which was really the letter T with a circle on top of it. But look also in red there, you can see what we would call a typical Christian cross. Where did the Christians get this from? Well, they copied it from the Egyptians. In fact, even in Egyptian jewelry, if you look at the second to last row at the bottom, you will see there is a row in this necklace of little crosses. It was a mystical symbol that people were going to keep hold of so that they were having protection from the gods. This is a headdress here. Egyptian. In the middle, you can see, once again, there is a cross in the center there. Now, this cross is what we know as the Maltese cross. And this also was not just a decoration, but also a talisman. Now, we can leave Egypt and we can go across to Hinduism. Here is a Hindu god, a very typical god with a snake uh, protecting him, the snake heads you can see above his head, but look to the bottom left of the picture. In that circle, there is a cross. The cross was also used within Hinduism. This Hindu god as well, on the left-hand side as we're looking at, this god's, one of this god's right arms, you can see there he has this symbol. It's a sun symbol with the cross in it. If we go to the Celtic religion, here within the Celtic religion, the cross was also being used as well. And then if we go to uh, Greek religion, thunder was a sign of the anger of the sun god. And one of the sun god's weapons was the lightning bolt. And so lightning was not just a symbol of his anger, but also the lightning bolt was given the mystical value of number six. And here we're looking at it with a Greek god. We can now look at it with a Roman god. And you will notice, if you look what he's holding in his hand, he's holding three lightning bolts, three sixes that he's holding in his hand. Back to Hinduism. Within Hinduism, we also find, again, 
th this is a lance, a, uh, a Sufic lance, uh, sorry, a, a Brahmin lance, and this was supposed to represent the lightning bolt. Then there was the Roman goddess here, who is holding once again three lightning bolts in her hand, six, 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 666 is the symbol represented there. And you'll note that the gods could be either male or female. It didn't matter because both of them represented Satan. Now, the ancient people believed that when they died, that particularly their priests, kings, went and inhabited the stars. And so they looked to the stars and worshipped the stars as well. And so you find, as in Hinduism here, here is a selection of Hindu gods, but look above their heads, you can see they represent the sun, Venus, Mercury, all of the planets are there, and they are also being worshipped as gods. This also creeps in to the days of the week that we have today. Now, you know, the first day of the week for us is Sunday. Why is it Sunday? Because it's the venerable day of the sun, the sun being the most powerful of the ancient gods. It was given the first day of the week. The second day went to the consort of the sun to the moon. And so the moon day or Monday, and then the other days are according to the Nordic gods that you can see here. So we don't think about this, but Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, even Saturday are all appointed according to the gods of the Nordic system. Now, because of the way that the sun appeared to serpentine its way through the constellations, the snake also came to represent the sun god. Now, this is an Islamic chart here, where you can see the sun is represented as a snake. If we go to uh, here, this is Roman Egyptian, where you have the snake representing a god there. Here in Egypt, this is the palace of Queen Hatshepsut. It's not so easy to see this, but on the side of the entranceway there, this is done in the pattern of a snake. And if I move on to the next slide, you can see this is an artist's impression of what it would have looked like. And there you can see that snake pattern snaking all the way up. Interestingly, it was a winged serpent. In, you can see here in this is a Greek temple where you can see at the top the two winged serpents also having the upper bodies of men holding the sun because there was this representation between the sun and the snake. If we go now to a Roman tomb, there again, this once again has got an Egyptian influence. It's a Roman tomb in the north of Egypt in the town of Alexandria, but there are the snakes guiding the entrance to this tomb. Chinese, you can see again, there are the snakes either side of the sun ball in the middle. And notice the swastikas hanging down there. There's a whole row of little swastikas. Why are they there? Well, the swastika also represented the sun. And so you find these little swastikas are there because it's a sun worshiping temple. Once again, back to Hinduism. There you can see, there is one of the gods reclining on the coils of the snake and although it's been damaged, you can just make out that there are the seven heads of the snake that are arching up. It's almost become the god's pillow to lay on. If we go to Mexico as well, here is in a Mexican temple. This is a snake with its head at the bottom, its body up in the air, and there's a tail there. That would be the tail of the rattlesnake. We go across to Scandinavia. On the side of Scandinavian buildings, there were these snake emblems that were there. We go to Thailand. Even though Thai, Thailand is a Theravada Buddhist country, you can see that an emblem they use a lot within Buddhism is a seven-headed snake. And here we're looking at the seat of the boy king Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun, he sat on this seat, but either side there was a winged snake that was uh, looking after him, that was protecting him. And perhaps when he would die, he would go into a coffin like this one that had the snake painted on it to protect the body of the person that was put in it. 
And on the outside of this sarcophagus, at the bottom there, you can see the rippling line of this long winged snake, once again to guard and protect. Here is uh, Asclepius, the snake. This is on a um, this is a Roman coffin, if I remember correctly. Within all of the false religions of the world, the snake takes the position as representative of the chief god. Now, for Christians, that's rather interesting because we go back to the Garden of Eden and what animal did Satan use to get to the people initially, to get to Adam and Eve, to cause them to fall? He spoke to them in the guise of a snake and cause them to sin. And perhaps it wouldn't be too much of a surprise for us to recognize that within the different religions, there was the idea of the snake as representing the Messiah. He was the promised branch. He was the, the savior of the world. In fact, he was worshiped in the form of a snake and in the form of a man. He was worshiped as being the Messiah who came and died as a sacrifice for man. And sometimes he was both snake and man at the same time. And as I say, all of this points us back to the Garden of Eden. Since the fall of mankind, the snake represented or has represented Satan and his attempt to establish his own theocratic empire on this world. As this picture shows us, it doesn't matter which religion you turn to, which denomination you turn to, Satan is working through all of it. The, the trunk of the tree here represents that first lie from Satan about the immortality of the soul, you shall not surely die. And then everything branches out from that, whether it's Hinduism, Druidism, Brahminism, whether it's the idea of prayers for the dead, purgatory, mariolatry, universality, and eventually in today's modern world, spiritualism. All of this comes from Satan's work in the Garden of Eden. Now, we go back now to Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 and 9. Here it says, Cush begat Nimrod. Nimrod began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And this idea of before the Lord, the meaning really could be better rendered a mighty hunter against the Lord, because he exalted himself as one of the first priest kings as one of the first gods on earth in verse 9 whereof it, wherefore it is said even as nimrod the mighty hunter before the lord nimrod according to tradition was one of the first to mount on horses and go out hunting he was known for subduing the wild animals that uh, roamed the countryside at that time and he was also responsible for the construction of the tower of babel which was actually an astronomical observatory with each level dedicated to one of the planets. And this idea of reaching up to the skies, examining the skies as being where God lived, this also came into the e Egyptian religions where you had the pyramids. Sometimes the pyramid was made of steps, Sometimes the pyramid had a 60 degree equilateral triangle. Now, if you think about that 60 degrees equilateral triangle, for those of you versed in geometry, you will know that means that each corner is 60 degrees. Now, according to the old rules of numerology that came out of Babylon, the number 60 could be reduced by adding six to the zero to give you the number six. And so, also with these pyramids, they would have a mystical representation. Pyramids can be found all over the world. This one is in Mexico. Again, a leftover from ancient religions, but here we're looking at pyramids that were dedicated to the sun, dedicated to the moon, dedicated to the various different religious bodies. So this idea, this false religion had spread throughout the world. You know, the Bible recognizes only two religions. There is the Church of Christ and there is the Synagogue of Satan. And indeed, when we look at the history of world religions, 
we find that this is exactly the way it goes, that it's either people following Christ, following God, the true religion, or it is people following the false, following Satan. Now, when Nimrod died, according to the tradition at the hands of his uncle Shem, his wife Semiramis claimed that he had gone to live in the sun and had become the sun god. This not only reinforced the idea of the sun as the dwelling place of the most powerful of the expanding pantheon of gods, but it also introduced the hidden, all-seeing God. There was Nimrod up in the sky looking down at his people. He saw what his people were doing and he was there ready to punish them if necessary. And so he's represented by the all-seeing eye in various pagan religions. Now I want you to pause just for a second to look at this picture here. This picture I took in an unopened tomb in Egypt back in the 1970s when I used to live out there. I was most intrigued by the serpent because you'll notice it's obviously a serpent but he has wings and he has legs. For some reason the Egyptians had this idea of there being a winged, walking, potentially talking serpent. They had this memory, what you would almost call a, an archaeological memory of how the serpent was before it was used by Satan. Now the idea of the um, all-seeing eye was also present in all of pagan religions. This god was associated with the serpent, um, often, as we've seen, described in its unformed state, and many pagan worshippers took to carrying the symbol of their god as an eye to appease him and to show their allegiance. Once again, it permeates all religions. Here is a Buddhist stupa, but when we look closely at the Buddhist stupa, there we can see the eyes of the god looking out. Now Semiramis, the widow of Nimrod, then took over the pagan priesthood and the construction of Babylon. And the Assyrian name for, for Semira Semiramis is Astarte or Ishtar, which is often pronounced as Easter, particularly in Nineveh. They refer to her as Easter. She was revered as the woman who built the encompassing wall or towers. And this refers to the part that Semiramis played, according to pagan history, in the construction of the Tower of Babel. The Roman version of Semiramis was Diana, the goddess of the hunt and the moon, and she can also be found, and we'll see her later on, as having a tower on her head. Let us just, before we look at that, let's just look at this one here. Do you recognize this representation here? This again is actually a representation of Semiramis, but this is the statue that was made by the French as a gift for the United States. This is the Statue of Liberty that has the sun crown, the tower on her head, and is hiding, holding high the torch of light, the sun torch that she has there. Now let's have a look again. This is Diana. Once again, you will see for obvious reasons that she was also known as a goddess of fertility. She had a sun disk behind her head to show that the sun god was behind her. And on her head, there was the tower showing the part that she played in the making of the Tower of Babel. There is also here Venus. Now Venus, it is claimed, ascended out of the seas on a scallop shell, that seashell that you can see there, and so the shell also became associated with the false religion and actually was a sexual symbol and a symbol of resurrection. By the time or sometime after Nimrod's death, the rather licentious Semiramis fell pregnant and to disguise the truth of her debauchery, she claimed that the resulting child, Tammuz, which is referred to in the book of Ezekiel, was born of an immaculate conception and that he was the promised savior of the world. Because of this event, Semiramis was also able to claim for herself the title Mother of God and Queen of Heaven. And these were the titles that were held in paganism long before 
that idea of the Virgin Mary having these titles entered into fallen Christianity. The mother and child motif then appeared in many religions. Here again, we see in, this is in Hinduism, but this is the Krishna religion. Now, where did Krishna come from? The idea of the mother and the baby Krishna. This developed after Christianity went into India because of the spectacular success that the apostle Thomas had when he went to India. Uh, we find that the Brahmins there had to introduce their own Messiah. And so they brought in their version, the little baby Krishna there, who was their Messiah to try and counter Christianity. Here we're looking at both Babylonian and Indian representations, but you can see again the motif of mother and child. Tammuz was the first of many false messiahs in Satan's plan of deception, the corruption of God's wonderful plan of redemption. According to the pagan stories, he was killed as a young man in a hunting accident. And this is why in Ezekiel chapter 8, the apostate women of Israel are described as weeping for Tammuz. His birth date, interestingly enough, was the 25th of December. And the 40 days of Lent in modern Catholic Christianity mark his death and the time of mourning for him. The symbol of Tammuz was the T or the Tau cross with the sun disk mounted on it. It also identified him as being a sun god. And Nimrod and Tammuz became associated as one god, like Osiris and Horus in Egypt, or the father and son of Christianity. And the circle uh, on top of the cross, the Ankh symbol, became known as the key of life when it was used within the Egyptian religion. In fact, it seems that almost anything and everything could represent and be worshipped in the name of the sun. The ancient Egyptians viewed the dung beetle pushing his ball of dung, and they then allegorized him into Hefa. Hefa was the beetle god who pushed the sun across the sky or carried it on his back. And the circle or sun disk which not only represented the sun, but also the astrological circle, this became the symbol of Satan's influence. Uh, this was a representation that was handed down again through all of the different pagan religions. Here, if you look center top of the screen, you can see there is the sun, there's a little snake in the middle of the sun to show us that this is the serpent god. And you see the rays of the sun come out and they are like little hands that are touching. This is Tutankhamun and his consort. And if you look at the crowns that they are wearing, they have got the sun discs on them and particularly Tutankhamun's, it's snakes with sun discs on them as well. In fact, we can go across to um, Buddhism. Here is the Buddha represented as having the sun disc on top of his head. Within Hinduism, there is the sun disk as well. And within all of paganism, the most potent and powerful of animals also came to symbolize the worship of Satan disguised in the pagan religions. So for example, the eagle, the most powerful of the birds, the griffin, this fantastic animal that was part bird, part, part animal, the bull, also an animal renowned for its potency. And this symbol was used in Egypt and even became the, the bull carrying the sun disk on its head and having a little cross around its neck. The children of Israel, when they came out of Egyptian captivity, it was the Egyptian calf, the bull god Apis, that they worshiped at the foot of Mount Sinai while Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments. In Rome, the bull came to represent Mithra, and there was the cult of the bull within Mithraism, and Mithra was another one of the pagan messiahs who was there apparently to help all mankind. We can see here in this uh, cylinder seal, it's a cylinder seal of Darius, or Darius, 
uh, the sun god possesses eagle's wings in the shape of a cross. Or in the Egyptian religion where the sun disk and eagle's wings were combined together, or the bull, the snake, and the disc all there together once again to represent this sun god. In Mexico, the sun god was a feathered serpent. And in Rome, the worship of Mithra arose combining the serpent and the lion. And Mithra was the one that held the keys to heaven and hell. In Egypt also could be seen the cross anks, the keys of life, life representing the God having the power to resurrect the people, holding the keys to heaven and hell. Now, when the Babylonians watched the sun set, it appeared to drop into the ocean. And so the sun god became the fish god, and they worshipped Dagon as the fish god, representing the sun. The priests sometimes would put on the actual skins of fish, to, to wear them during their rites. And over the years, this fish costume reduced until it was only the head of the fish, a hat representing the fish god that was worn. How do we know this is a pagan sun god representation? Well, again, look what's being thrown from the hand. Three lightning bolts there. Once again, 666 is the representation, representation that we're given. The zodiac also developed into all of the different religions. Here at the top left, you can see some of the representations of the Egyptian zodiac. And this system was developed through all of the pagan religions. Once again, here is the Egyptian horoscope. This one here is from the Babylonian system. In Mithraism, there is Mithra killing the bull, but around him, there are the symbols that we recognize in today's astrology. And so the symbols basically remain the same. When people talk about astrology today, well, they're talking about fortune telling, we know, but what they don't realize is that all of this is an extension of the pagan worship system. Even when we come to Greece, here is Hercules with the world on his shoulders. But again, it's an extension of astrology because there are the astrological symbols projected onto the globe that he is here wearing. As the leaders of the various empires were also often the high priests of the religions, the symbols of their power were the symbols of the religions. In Egypt, the snake, Satan, the supposed giver of earthly power to the apostate empires, was represented by the serpent staff that was carried both by the gods and by the priest kings themselves. Now, although Christianity overcame paganism in all parts of the world, in time there was an infiltration of paganism into the church. Paganism and Christianity were eventually united within the apostate Christian church. Eusebius tells us that in order to attach to Christianity great attraction in the eyes of the nobility, the priests adopted the outer garments and adornments which were used in pagan cults. In the pagan Roman religion, the cosmic god was referred to by the name Catholicus, eventually paganized Christianity became known as the Catholic religion. Now the word Catholic in Latin means universal. Within this religion, over time, all of the trappings of paganism became absorbed. That well-known and prolific religious writer and historian, Ellen White, in her book, The Great Controversy, tells us this. She says, the world cloaked with a form of righteousness now walked into the church. The work of corruption rapidly progressed. Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. Her spirit controlled the church. Her doctrines, ceremonies, and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the professed followers of Jesus Christ. 
Similarly, the famous Protestant author, the Reverend J. A. Wiley, he says that popery is the gospel transubstantiated into the flesh and blood of paganism under a few of the accidents of Christianity. And so, as we're told in the book, The History of Civilization, pagan ceremonies were established in Christian churches until Christianity exhibited so grotesque and hideous a form that its best features were lost and its earlier loveliness altogether destroyed. Cardinal Newn puts it this way, Roman Catholic Cardinal writes, confiding then in the power of Christianity to resist the infection of evil and to transmute the instruments and appendages of demon worship to an evangelical use, the rulers of the church from early times were prepared should occasion arise to adopt or imitate or sanction the existing rites and customs of the populace. Now, I want to pause here just for a second to emphasize this. This is not me looking at this and saying, oh, it looks like this has happened. But actually, you can see here, Cardinal Newman says, no, that's exactly what we did. We adopted all the symbols, the instruments and appendages of, of what does he say, of demon worship. And then we use them for an evangelical use. How is it possible that one could even conceive of using the instruments and appendages of demon worship for an evangelical use. But look at what happened. Following this system of adoption, Semiramis and Tammuz became Mary and Jesus. The 40 days of weeping for Tammuz became the 40 days of Lent. In 1950, Mary, the mother of Jesus, became known as the Queen of Heaven. Now again, let's just pause for a second. 1950 was when this was with this happened. This is not some old medieval practice, even in modern times. They continue drawing in paganism into the church. Mary also became the mother of God with the tower over her head. And uh, the question may be asked, but which God was she the mother of? Perhaps the answer is obvious when we see the sun that Mary holds in her arms. This is a statue of Mary from the Vatican. Let's do a close up. When we look up closer, you can see the sun that's in her arms is the S-U-N, not the S-O-N. All right, what else came in? Well, the scallop shell of Venus became the scallop shell of Mary. The, the sun cross became allegorized into a symbol of the crucifix. Even the ark, which you can see here, bottom left and right, this was brought into Christianity. There in a, a, an old first, second century Christian church in the middle of the palm tree, there is the symbol of the ark. This was a supposed Christian saint holding an ark as well. The towers with the cross on them. Here you can see in Egyptian hieroglyphics, if you wanted to worship the sun god, well, you wanted to get up high. And so you would build a tower. You would raise the cross up there so that you can see that you are worshipping the sun god. This as well came into Christianity as the cross on top of the church tower. All the animals of paganism also came into the church. The eagle of paganism became the eagle of Christianity. The Babylonian griffin became the griffin of Christianity. The Dagon fish costume degenerated via the Egyptian sun snake religion into the fish hat of modern bishops and popes. And you can see here, this is Pope John Paul II, the fish head on his head and the two tails at the back is all that's left of the rest of the fish. The lion god of paganism became the lion of Christianity, here protecting the papal crown. The Babylonian bull god also became the bull of the papacy. And I'm not talking about the papal bulls as in the, the pronouncements that they make, but actually you can see here is this bull. Where was this taken? This is Westminster Cathedral. 
where this was taken. So the, the largest Catholic church in England shows the bull there as part of the decoration, supposedly that bull holding a copy of the Bible. Here you have the sun disk of paganism. Well, that became the sun disk of Christianity, the halos of Christ and the saints. The 666 pyramids, uh, this also matched with the all-seeing eye and the sun god in the triangle put all three of them together, walk into a church and you find the all-seeing eye in the pyramid, supposedly now a symbol of the Jehovah God. The lightning bolt, the symbol of the sun god, became the symbol of not only the papacy, but also the symbol of the church. Here is the church supposedly fighting against the Reformation. What does this woman, religion, have in her hand? Three lightning bolts. This is in the church of uh, the Cesar del Jesu, the church of the Jesuits, where Ignacio de Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, is buried. We have also the adoration of the um, images of the gods became the veneration of the images of the saints. And even the rosaries and repetitious prayers, they came from various pagan representations, from Babylon, from Buddhism, all of it brought in to the Catholic Church. Mithras holding the keys of heaven and hell became St. Peter holding the keys of heaven and hell. This statue was in fact originally Jupiter in the Roman Parthenon and then it was moved across the road, put in the Vatican and called Peter the first pope. In paganism we have the high priest being carried on a throne by 12 men into the temple of the pagan god with fans in attendance and this became the pope on the Sedia Gestoria being carried by 12 men with fans in attendance. Even into the modern day we see this representation, representation and it is an exact representation of what they did in the time of Babylon and Egypt. The triple crown of the Babylonian priest kings became the Pope wearing the triple crown of heaven, earth and hell, as is attested by the following quote from a Catholic encyclopedia that says, hence the Pope is crowned with a triple crown as king of heaven and of earth and of the lower regions. The wafer god of paganism became the wafer god in Catholicism, the offering of daily sacrifices. And everywhere this mystical number of 666 was displayed. Here, if you look at the design of the windows, now once again, this is Westminster Cathedral, but you see those circular windows there composed of three sixes placed together. Here on a Catholic church in the south of Hungary, there is a, a, a priest, perhaps a saint, with the sun's rays coming out from above his head, but the staff that he's carrying, that serpent staff, with the triple six symbol on it as well. Uh, same design that can be seen, of course, in paganism. These are Celtic symbols here. Here they can be seen on the floor of uh, Westminster Cathedral. Once again, there is this 666 symbol. It's right there. If you walk into Westminster Cathedral in the center of London, there you find that 666 symbol. Here, the letters displayed on the monstrance. This is where the wafer god is kept in Catholicism. You may remember that in one of the presentations, we talked about this doctrine of transubstantiation, where the wafer god is transformed into actually being Christ. If you look there, underneath where the wafer is put, you can see the letters SFS. What does that represent? Well, S is a snake symbol. Not only is it formed in the shape of a snake, but it represents the hissing sound of the snake as well. You know, the snake is very much associated with the letter S. 
What about the F that comes next? Well, the F is the sixth letter of the Latin alphabet and also associated with the snake. We will see in a second that S and F were in fact used to be interchangeable letters within Christianity. If you look, the letter V is also associated with the letter F as it's shown in words like knife, knives, life, and lives, because this was one of the letters that was found on the back of the hood of the cobra snake. Here is a, uh, is the, a section from the book of Isaiah from an old English Bible. You can see there where it says Christ's passion. In both of those words, there is one S is represented by a letter that looks very much like an F. So the letter F was also associated with the letter S in old typefaces. Now, why is this important? Because we go back to that monstrance and what do we see? S, F, S is actually 666 written right there. The trident also represented the number 666 because of the three prongs on the trident. It's found in Hinduism today. It was found in ancient Egypt. And it was also found in Hebrew lettering. It was associated with the Hebrew letter Shin, which shows its, its 666 heritage, because the Hebrew letter Shin is made up of three vowels. The vowel is one of the Hebrew Chaldean words for six, also translated as nail in some lexicons. And so you will go and look at the floor of a Catholic church and find three nails there because they say not just that it was the three nails that crucified Christ but also because there is this representation that this is a 666 symbol. Here again another Catholic church three nails there under the supposed name of Jesus. Now you may think this is going a little bit crazy to look at this but okay let's show you another one. Here is Mary and child, and look, the child on his head, those three prongs of the trident, there is a 666 symbol, but look at the hand of what's supposed to be the baby Jesus. I mean, both of the hands, one hand has a globe with a cross on it, the other hand has a hand with three fingers sticking up. Now, what did that actually mean? This the raising up of three fingers. Now, basically, if you were caught out and you didn't have your amulet with you and you thought the gods were angry at you, you could raise up three fingers. And these three fingers would represent the number 666, represent the number of all the gods. So it would help you, you would be protected. And so we find in paganism, these votive hands that people would carry around with them. They're carrying a 666 symbol. This also came into the church as well, as you can see on Christ here. But what's that in the middle of his chest? This is the sacred heart. Now, this is the Christianization of the sacrificial heart of paganism. The serpent staff of the pagans became the serpent staff, the crozier of the priests, often with its heritage prominently displayed. You can see this crozier is actually made in the form of a snake. 666 symbolism was incorporated into pagan temple architecture. Now, you might start to laugh at me at this. I went to Egypt, I saw this, this temple, and so I started to count the number of serpents that were there. And if you start to count it, you will find that there's three lots of 30, 36 that's being used. I couldn't photograph all of them, but they also have six pillars standing up. There are sixes found everywhere in pagan architecture. And so when you go and look at this cathedral of St. Mary in San Francisco, looking from the cathedral outwards into the courtyard, there are three rows of three complete crosses there. So for some reason, the number 666 was used in their architecture as well. It's rather bizarre, and this is again is where you might think that I've found, become a little bit of a fanatic about this, but I found that when I go into churches, if I count the number of steps leading up to the altar, there are often six steps that lead up 
to the altar. What is this fascination with the number six? The flying serpents that guarded the pagan temples, these became the, the serpents on the door handle. This is St. Mary's Cathedral in San Francisco. This is a church in South London. Look at the hinges on the doors. Yes, you can't help but say it, it looks like a serpent. And the winged serpent also became prominent in the Vatican, in to on top of St. Martin's Church in London. The snake is a common symbol around the world, sometimes coiled around the chalice, as we can see here on the top of this church. This was in Czechoslovakia. It's a common symbol all around. Here in Hungary, the snake coiled around the cross. The pagan high priest, as the incarnation of the sun god, became the pope as the vicarious Christ. Now, I don't know if you're going to be able to read this here, but this is a letter that was sent out from the cardinal's residence in uh, 1904. It says, in reply to your letter of the 18th, um, I want to say this, that I cannot say with certainty that the words vicarious filet dei are on the Pope's tiara, but the words are used by the cardinals uh, who put it on the tiara at the, cor uh, sorry, when they put the tiara on the Pope's head at the coronation of the Pope. So one of the titles of the Pope is this vicarious filet dei. Here again, this is uh, an article from the, I think this is, if I remember correctly, this is the Catholic Examiner. And if you can see there in the center, beginning of that column, it says, what are the letters supposed to be in the Pope's crown? And what do they signify, if anything? And it says, the letters inscribed in the Pope's mitre are these, Vicarius Filet Dei, which is Latin for Vicar of the Son of God. Catholics hold that the church, which is a visible society, must have a visible head. Christ, before his ascension into heaven, appointed St. Peter to act as his representative. On the death of St. Peter, the man who succeeded to the office of Peter as the Bishop of Rome was recognized as the head of the church. Hence, the Bishop of Rome, as head of the church, was given the title Vicar of Christ. Now, this is rather interesting because what they're saying, they're talking about vicar of Christ, they're saying that they're translating it from the Latin, but the actual, they haven't translated the word vicar, because the word vicar or vicarious, it means in place of. So if we look at this quotation, there we are, it was from the Sunday Visitor, the 15th of April, 1915. So just over a hundred years ago, they said this, the letters inscribed in the Pope's mitre are these, vicarious filet dei, which is Latin for, now I'm going to properly translate it, in place of the Son of God. So vicar of the Son of God actually means in place of the Son of God. Now this then becomes rather interesting because we're looking at the titles that are being held by the papacy. Let's look at another title. There is the title Pontifex Maximus, Supreme Bridge Builder. This was originally used by the Babylonians, and it means the person who bridges the gap between man and the pagan sun god, because originally they said the sun god, he wasn't going to come down and talk to ordinary men. You needed an intermediary. You needed somebody to stand in your place who could talk to God. And so that person, the Latin title for that person in the Roman religion was Pontifex Maximus. If you speak French, you will know that the French word for bridge is pont, P-O-N-T. So here, Pontifex Maximus. Pontifex, bridge builder, Maximus Supreme, the supreme bridge builder. Is it a title of the Pope today? Well, here's a medallion from the US visit of Pope Francis. And what does it say underneath? Franciscus Pontifex Maximus. You can see only five years ago, this term was being used. What else has the papacy brought in? Well, here's a painting of one of the popes and above his head, you can see the astrological circle of the world. In the Triumphal di 
uh, Fortuna di Sigismundo. Here there's a representative of the Pope sitting on top of the world. You see the astrological band going around it. The world is being held by Hercules. And then on the left hand side, an angel is turning it. On the right hand side, a devil is turning it. But there is the Pope as Lord of the world sitting on top of the astrological circle. Here again, there is the Pope with his triple crown on, fanning the flames of persecution around the world. But look, the men next to him with that globe, they are his astrologers who are telling him the right time, the right times, the auspicious times. So these titles were given to the Pope. And let's just look at some of these titles from the Greek. Here are some Greek titles for the Pope. The first one is the Latin Kingdom. How do you say the Latin Kingdom in Greek? Look, I'm not going to try and pronounce this. You can see it written out there, the, the Latin Basilia. And these are the numbers according to the Greek system of uh, numeracy. These are the numbers that you would give to those letters for the Latin Kingdom. What does that add up to? I don't know if you're quick enough to be able to add this up. I'm going to move on and well, let me tell you very quickly, there is the sum of those le letters, the num numerical value adds up to 666. Let's look at another title, the Italian church. Let's translate that into the Greek, then we put the numerical numbers underneath. If you can quickly add those up, I don't know how fast you can do it, but the answer is 666, 666, it adds up too. Let's have a look at another one, Latin speaking man. Here it is, Latinos, very simple. That's the numerical representation for the letters. What does it add up to? Well, I'm sure you're ahead of me. Yes, it adds up to 666. So let's now look at Italian in the Latin language, the Latin transliteration of Vicarious Filet Dei. Now you remember, we saw already where the papacy has said, yes, this is a title, the title of the Pope. When we give it the numerical values according to the Latin method of numerology, there we go, those are the numerical values. If we add them up, what do we get to as the grand total? Yes, once again, 666. For those who can read the signs, the Roman Catholic Church exposes itself as the religion, the church of 666. The Bible tells us to avoid taking the mark of the beast, which has that number, 666. Well, we've looked previously at what the mark of that beast was, that it's Sunday keeping. What we're doing here now is really just confirming that we've got it right. This is the beast, because the number of the beast, it's the number of a man, it's the number of the vicarious filet day, it's the number of the papacy, 666. Now remember, this number is not the mark itself. The mark will be, when it is introduced by law, will be Sunday worship. But at least we can verify what we're looking at. It seems we got it right because this church openly declares who and what it is. It's all a deception so that we should miss out on the great reward that Jesus has for those who avoid the organization that bears this number. So as we close tonight, I just want to say to you, you should by now have a very good idea of exactly what the problem is. The solution is Jesus Christ. This evening, once again, Christ is calling to each one of us. But part of the message that we have to bear is to call people out of Babylon. I believe with this presentation we have identified who and what Babylon actually is. 
So we need to fulfill that calling that Christ has given us, that we need to get out on the highways and byways, virtually or actually, and call people out of the Roman Catholic Church, call them out of Mystery Babylon, and bring them in to Christ's kingdom in preparation for his soon return. And I pray that God will bless us, everyone, as we meditate on this information. Amen. <laughs>